My name is Ryan Miller, and for the past 15 years, I've helped hundreds of people to raise millions of dollars for their funds and for their startups. If you're serious about raising money, launching your business, or taking your life to the next level, this show will give you the answers so that you too can enjoy your pursuit of making billions. Let's get into it. In this week's episode, I bring on my dear friend, Roland Frazier. Roland is the founder and CEO of EpicNetwork.com, as well as a recovering attorney that has gone full God mode on private equity. Roland and his lessons on EpicNetwork.com will teach you how to buy businesses with little to no money out of your pocket. You do not want to miss this. Plus, Roland opens up and reveals his secret rule of 40 methodology for finding and evaluating private businesses launching you to a future with companies that give massive returns. Finding private businesses and purchasing them intelligently will help us all in our pursuit of making billions. Here we go. Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have my dear friend, Roland Fraser. Roland is a recovering attorney that has gone full God mode on private equity, public speaking, and social media. He runs Epic Network, where he teaches everyone how to buy businesses with little to no money out of their pocket. He's been in magazines such as Forbes and Inc. He's consulted companies like Pepsi, McDonald's, Microsoft, Uber, Southwest Airlines, FedEx, and more. What this means is this guy's about to drop a ton of wisdom on how to make jaw-dropping returns from buying businesses. Roland Fraser, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. Oh, man, it's good to have you here. I've been following your work for such a long time. And I must say, I am a huge fan of yours, and I cannot tell you how excited I am that you're about to share a lot of your wisdom to our fans around the world. Now, that being said, um, usually we'll kick this off. I'm sure a lot of people want to know. We can see Roland. We can see you everywhere. You're doing all this amazing stuff. But how did it start for you? Where, where did it begin? And maybe walk us up to how you became Roland uh, today from where it started. Sure. I, I started with um, with just really being curious about what it meant to have the money to do what you wanted to be able to do in life. And um, I grew up with my father uh, continues to be a tax attorney. And so there were always colorful characters that were in our life, in his office, running into out in the store. And um, I kind of got this feeling of this seems like these guys are all entrepreneurs and they've got just this wide range of business from owning racehorses to gold mines to software companies to record stores and that that was really cool and i wanted to do something like that where i didn't have to be the person who was actually honestly in my father's role of being in a suit and tie in an office with fluorescent lights. I liked the guys that rolled in in their jeans and could kind of do whatever they wanted to do. And they all seemed like they were having a good time and entrepreneurs. And, and of course, because he was a tax attorney, most of them were doing well enough that they were making enough money. They needed some help with taxes. So, yeah. um, so that was kind of a cool intro. And, um, and he told me when I was kind of like, I'm not sure what I want to be when I grow up, and which I'm still not sure of, uh, that uh, he said, well, if you don't know what you want to do, I can tell you that um, having an accounting degree and understanding financial statements and how money works will always be valuable to you. And uh, understanding the law will always be valuable to you. And of course, there was a little bit of an agenda that he had there because he uh, he was an accountant and an attorney. So, you know, that's, that's, that's a good way to get your kid to follow in your footsteps. But he sold it to me and I was like, that sounds good. Um, so then I kind of immersed myself in all different sorts of how do you invest and things like that. I uh, found a book that he recommended, uh, he actually recommended it to me. I didn't find it. Um, but, uh, called nothing down by a guy named Robert Allen, which was how to buy real estate with little or no money out of pocket. And, um, I just ate that up. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. I couldn't believe that you could do that. Of course, at the time, interest rates were like 12 or 14%. And so he was, uh, talking about interest rates that were 6%. And I was like, well, that's never happening again. So that's funny (laughs) to watch that wheel spin. But, um, but that that really got me into real estate first, and um, that and a combination of uh, he had a copy of Dennis Waitley's 
uh, psychology of winning and it was an audio program. And so I listened to that and I'd never really heard about setting goals before and all the stuff that Dennis talked about. And, um, so those two things lit me up and I was like, I want to set goals and I'm going to do real estate stuff and I'm going to be a real estate mogul. So I got, uh, as soon as I could, I was thinking I was about 16 at the time. So then, um, as soon as I could, I took the real estate, uh, agents exam in, uh, in Virginia and got my license and started selling real estate and pounding the beat door to door and realized that I really hated doing that because it seemed like an awful lot of work, even though the payoff could be decent and, um, was like, well, who's got a bunch of things to sell so that I don't have to, like, I can find one person and sell again and again and again. The answer to that was developers. So I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll approach developers. And I did. And then I started asking them, I was like, well, how do you, you seem like you're making a lot of money doing this developing stuff. How do you do that? And they're like, well, we raise money through limited partnerships and investors, and then they get a return and we get a, a piece of that. And I was like, that sounds awesome. Can I do that? No, you need a, a securities license to raise money and you need a, uh, you know, and, and then, you know, you got to get insurance and all that. And I'm like, Ooh, insurance, that sounds like a commission. So I was yeah. like, okay, I got my insurance license when I was 19, when I was 20, I went up to Washington DC and took the securities exam for series seven because they didn't offer it in the, you know, in the, in, at least in Virginia at the time. Yeah. And, um, and I was like, okay, I'm going to raise money, did a bunch of developments. Um, and, uh, all actually Virginia, Carolinas, um, all the way down to the Cayman islands and, um, really, got into that. And I was like, this is awesome. And then I got introduced to somebody at Prudential Securities as a result of having the securities license with the firm that was up in New York. And one of the investment bankers there took me under his wing. And at the time, leverage buyouts were really huge. This was in the eighties. And so, um, I was like, well, that's kind of cool. You can buy companies with no money out of pocket too, just like real estate. And he's like, oh, hell yeah. We do that all the time. We do like billion dollar deals. And I was like, well, that sounds cool. Yeah. So uh, I realized that you could start applying a lot of what I knew from real estate and uh, creative finance and um, investment banking, Wall Street creative finance to actually own companies. And so once you get hooked on that and do your first couple of deals, you're like, wow, I think, I think there's something to this. And so that that got me into the whole deal world. And along the line, working as a real estate agent, insurance agent, uh, you know, securities money raiser, and then getting a degree in accounting uh, and then going to law school because I still never knew what I wanted to do um, along the way was helpful. Um, I don't think any of those things are critical, but it just that that was my path to getting, you know, to learning that you could do this. And then it was just making all the mistakes you could possibly make along the way. And, um, and then, you know, hopefully I make fewer of those now. <laughs> yeah. Wow. What an incredible story. So y you have quite a breadth of experience. You're bringing it all together on buying businesses. So how did you go from that into uh, the organization that you're running now? So maybe walk us through the bridge of saying, I, you know, I did all this stuff and now like you're laser focused, man, you, you've got, you built quite an impressive uh, company and following. How did you go from kind of this breadth to a very focused approach? Well, I, I, I love that you think that I'm focused. That makes me feel really good. Um, <laughs> The, the, I mean, I, so all of the things that I did kind of got me into doing deals. And so, um, particularly once I started practicing law, I just couldn't help from all my business experience, seeing that there were opportunities in clients, businesses to do better, to grow faster, to make more money, to fix things that were broken. And, um, rather than get paid dollars per hour, even though it was, you know, a lot of dollars per hour being an attorney. I realized that I could do a lot more in terms of building wealth and making money if I could get pieces of those deals. And so I started suggesting to clients, you know, hey, don't hire me by the hour. Give me a piece of this business and let's, you know, let me come in and help add value to it. And that really led me into the idea of consulting for equity, which is one of my favorite things to do right now. And so where I am right now is, is I generally will put content out there and talk about all the kinds of stuff that you can do. And then that generates people who would like to be trained on how to either acquire companies for little or no money out of pocket or to consult for equity or to sell, to exit. And, um, and we're launching an exit, a course called Exit Ready coming up 
next month that kind of covers that part of things. Then we'll go into raising money and then we'll go into turnarounds and then that'll kind of, and entrepreneurial investing. So that'll kind of cover the, the six major areas of what I do. Um, and that educational component is designed number one, to make me a whole lot smarter and better. Cause a lot of the really cool tools that I've developed came as a result of how can I communicate this stuff to other people in a way that is relatively simple and makes sense. So I highly recommend anytime you want to get better, teach something because it will absolutely force you to be better. And the questions that will come in will make you better and sharper. And then you'll learn so much from the people that you're working with, because they're going to have all kinds of other experiences and knowledge and backgrounds that they're going to draw on as you're explaining things to them. And they're going to have different insights and you're going to be like, Oh my gosh, that's really great. And then that adds to what, you know, that adds to what you share with other people and everybody wins. And so all of that is designed. Number one, um, it makes me feel good to be able to share that. I love to teach. I love to share. I love all the messages that I get of people that are, you know, I just did this deal and I just did that deal. I just, I, I was at the valet leaving the mall where I just had a meeting and the valet came up to me and I had given him access to one of my classes because he said he recognized me at the valet and was like, you know, Oh, I want to learn about that. I was like, I'll comp you into the class. And, um, he's just done two deals. And I was like, that's awesome. Right. That's awesome. So, so that, and then also because it generates deal flow. So either people that have businesses, um, see the stuff that I put out and say, Hey, what would it be like to work with you? Um, or people who are doing deals who are like students will come and say, Hey, I got a deal, but it's a little bit too big. Can we do that together? And so that kind of is the extent of the focus other than knowing very, very clearly, what are your acquisition criteria so that you know what to say no or not now to, and what you know to pursue because your time ultimately becomes, you know, somewhat, somewhat of a constraint when you've got a lot of deal flow coming in, but that's it. And so like my laser focus is that I've been able to identify the deals that that generally work the best for me. Like I know I don't like inventory related businesses because that's an extra huge category of cost of goods sold that SaaS companies and information companies uh, and service companies don't have. I know that I don't like regulated industries that are heavily regulated because it's just extra hoops you have to jump through. I know that a business that's doing less than a million dollars a year in profit probably doesn't have enough maturity to be able to really get the most out of what I can bring to the table. And, um, and so like knowing those kinds of things really helps focus use, but I still am 38 different verticals deep across different holding companies that I've got. So it's, you know, so some people think that I'm not focused at all. <laughs> well, I would say you are, uh, at least, uh, through your education and all the courses that you're putting out there. Now, when it comes down to buying businesses, uh, we classify this as private equity, at least I do. So when it comes yeah. down to, uh, operating in private equity and the deals that you do, um, what are some of the things now you highlighted some of the, the high level sectors of what you look for as far as, you know, are, is it regulated or too regulated? All those areas. What are some of those internal macros that you like to see before that, that you're really sniffing around the company? You're exploring it. Is it profit margins? Is it channel strategy? What is it that you look for that you really say, ah, there might be something here? Yeah. So I, I like the rule of 40 as a guide. I think that if, if growth plus profits add up to 40, that's a good thing. So if it's experiencing 20% compound annual growth year over year and a 20% profit margin, I like that. I generally don't like businesses that have a profit margin of less than 15% in terms of profitability. So that means generally I would ideally like for them to be growing about 25% year over year and 15% bottom line in profits. I like businesses that have 10 employees or more, even if they're owner operated, I'm okay with owner operated if they're 10 employees or more, because there's probably some management structure in place when you've got that many employees that someone else has the tribal knowledge that the owner had. And it's not going to be like you're losing all of the value of the company's tribal knowledge when the owner operator leaves. Um, I like companies where the owner is interested in staying around and keeping a percentage of the company so that they can participate in a second bite at the apple when we exit. Um, 
And then I like service industries. I like franchise B2B, B2C service doesn't really matter. Like software as a service, like franchise, like home services, all of those um, fit into areas that, you know, that, that, that I'm interested in, but really that 10 employees or more, um, ideally, um, they haven't crossed 2 million in profit and 10 million in sales, because then you generally get a little bit more competitive with private equity. But Mm. I've done, you know, the deals that, that seem to be happening more often right now, I would actually think I'd be competing with private equity for, but because of my deal flow, I'm, I'm getting them before they get approached by those people or they have been approached, but they don't have a complicated cap table or they haven't done a deal yet. And so, and and I'd say right now, most of the deals that I'm doing are between five and $60 million as opposed to, you know, lower value deals. So that that's over my ideal threshold, but, um, but it just seems like as long as they're coming, I'm not going to say no to them as long as there's not a lot of competition from PE or family offices or somebody else that's in there trying to throw a bunch of money at them. Perfect. So um, the rule of 40, 10 employees, you like service franchise sectors and uh, typically a couple of financial metrics around the the 10 million range is what you like to do. Yeah. Excuse me. So if you have people um, that want to consult with for equity or want would love for you to come in and kind of work with them on a more of a partnership model. So it sounds like you've got multiple tiers on on your offering letter. So you have education programs that can help people to do it themselves, I'm assuming. And then you also kind of move your way up to saying, if you want to work with me, we've we've got a place for you as well. But here's some of those criteria. Is that your criteria or do you have additional things that when people approach you, you, you want to make sure they have in place. How does that Yeah, work? so uh, the acquisition criteria I gave you are primarily the metric KPI type acquisition okay. criteria. Yeah. In addition to that, I want people that have a prosperity mentality that are thinking in abundance, not scarcity. I want people that are um, that are clean in terms of they don't have a history of litigating with their partners and having fights and things like that. Um, and I want people that that really have um, high integrity with the desire to serve the customers. You know, you'll, you'll talk to some entrepreneurs who are really all about how can they get the most out of the customer. And those generally, those businesses don't do the best. Um, and the personalities don't match with me the best. So I'm really looking for somebody that's out to how can I serve the customer? How can I get the customer more all the time? Then how can I, you know, shave uh, a couple of extra points of profit off? Not I'm, I want the profit. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I believe that the profit comes as a result of serving the customer the best. You know, I, I recently had another show that complements exactly what you said uh, with Dr. Marvin Washington. Uh, he teaches on strategy and all these things. And we talked about um, operational efficiency and the kind of organizations that squeeze every penny and razor thin margins, but high growth. And then this other one that you're talking about, which I personally love, is this customer intimate approach. And that yeah. is not just an approach, a thing that we do like we're acting in a play. It's truly a deep rooted culture that you create. It is a culture. It is a Absolutely. culture. Yep. So um, I use the analogy when my wife and I went to uh, Vegas, we went to check out the Louis Vuitton store. And they literally, no exaggeration, on a silver platter had two champagne glasses. It was a very customer intimate approach just to say, we want you to feel loved and cared for. And we are all in with you the second you walk into our store, whether we buy something or not. We were all in. Now imagine yeah. having partners like that. I mean, yeah. who wouldn't want to work with someone like that? So right. I, yeah, I get it. I get your model, man. This this is really, really cool. Now, so when it comes to working together, there's got to be a good vibe with the partner. Also, the deal's got to make sense. So we want to make an impact, but also do it through the way of customer intimacy and really serving the customer through the the right cultural elements that we want to place. Now now moving forward, um, my understanding this is I'm just scratching the surface, man. You're you're a busy guy, so you, let's talk a little bit about uh, if you could share with the the our audience around the world. Will you talk a little bit about your education program and exactly what kind of things that people can expect when they're learning about how to buy businesses with little money out of their pocket? Uh, walk us through a little bit of those courses and some of that stuff that people can expect. Would it be okay if I reframe that a little bit and just ask you based on what you know of your audience, what you think the biggest sticking points that we could help them with would be? Sure. So um, a big one would be, gosh, these are, these are, 
these are broad, but uh, um, raising capital, uh, also those metrics that you talked about is a big one. What to look for, how to source deals, how to re- deal with investors. Um, so deal so sourcing, let's, let's, fundraising, any of those might be helpful. Okay, let, let's take them uh, uh, a few as I remember, and then you help me with the ones that I didn't. So let's start with like a lot of people, I, I, I think that it's important first to say, what do you need credibility wise, credential wise and experience wise to do deals. And I firmly believe that you don't need any degrees or certifications or anything like that to do deals because everybody starts out without any of that stuff. And while it's nice to have training and that's, you know, I, I give training, I do a free, uh, now, um, five day challenge where we show people how to, you know, how to acquire companies, that kind of education, the, you know, listen to your podcast or mine or, or those kinds of things to me can be definitely all you need because really what you need is all here. It's always the limitations, the limiting beliefs that we carry with us into anything are the things that stop us from moving forward. So I think I know that you, Ryan, I know that I can tell everybody that's watching or listening that you don't need degrees, diplomas, um, or certifications or anything from anybody to do a deal. All you need to do is to want to do a deal and recognize that there's something that the person you want to do a deal with, in this case, we're talking about acquisitions, um, I think, right? Um, (laughs) in, In the case of acquisitions, there's a lot of people out there that want to sell. We know that the data tells us there's about 600,000 people a year that just close their businesses down because they don't know what to do with it. And I just had like, when people are like, yeah, but those businesses probably suck. It's like, well, I just had somebody that was in our mastermind that was, that heard about and then approached an owner of a $15 million a year business that was doing 3 million in profit. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to acquire them. And they're like, oh, sweetheart, we shut that down about eight months ago. No. He's like, you shut it down. They're like, yeah, we, you know, we were tiring and the kids didn't want it. And, you know, we didn't want to really, we didn't really know what to do with it. Cause there's a lot of people out there that are accidental entrepreneurs that do not have any business training at all. I would say most entrepreneurs do not have any business training at all. They don't have any savvy on how to sell businesses or anything like that. They might talk to a business broker. And if they do, if they do that, even then 80% of those listings that get taken on are not going to sell. And so then they're going to be back where they started with a business that's great, that's making money, that their kids don't want because they're taking selfies on Instagram, they're gonna be influencers. And, um, And so they don't know what to do. And so the business just gets shut down or abandoned or given to the employees or something like that. And so like knowing that there is a great need out there and a great desire from a lot of motivated sellers to try to find somebody to carry on the legacy that they've started, to carry on the name of the business, to be able to get something from it when they retire, to be able to uh, not have the employees have to be fired and find new jobs, to be able to have the customers have a continuity of, of service that's still there. Like that means something to a whole lot of people. And um, so there's this giant unmet need and this incredibly inefficient system that we have that is very ineffective and inefficient in allowing people to sell the businesses that they've built. So you don't have to have a lot of skills or knowledge or, you know, credentials from anybody to go into this. And then the next thing would be, what about money? I got to have money if I'm going to buy a business. Well, if you're going to buy a business from an unmotivated seller who is engaging in a process to create an auction environment to sell their business, then yes, you'll probably have to have money. And um, are all the good businesses not available? Do do all the good businesses that are out there that are making money require you to have a big pile of money in your pocket? No, no, because if you can identify, you do need a motivated seller. So somebody that is aging out, somebody that has tried to sell their business but couldn't, somebody that's getting a divorce, somebody that's having a trouble trouble with their partners, somebody that's burnt out, somebody that's got shiny object syndrome, you know, all of somebody's relocating, somebody that's having a health problem, heirs where the parents have died and there's nobody to run the business, you know, there's all of these types of motivated sellers that are out there. And so if you can just find one of those, which there are literally at any given time, about three or 4 million of those people in the United States, Mm -hmm. according to data, um, 
then it kind of takes out of your head, well, I don't have to have a pile of money because these people just want to sell their business and haven't been able to. So I am coming in as somebody who offers a solution that they want and I don't have to have money. Now they would ask for it. I would, you would, all you guys that are listening probably would, right? But then if you say, hey, I don't have any, but let me see if I can get you what you want for the business in a different way. Are you open to that? Well, of course they're open to it because they can't get the other. Yeah. And if they tell you, no, I have to have money, then you're like, well, then go get that. How's that working out for you? Not well. You know, so it's like a lot of those deals might also come back around, but but like that's the first the first two big hurdles is understanding that there's a, this huge unmet need and um, and crazy amount of businesses that are available and that you don't have to be skilled or have a great amount of knowledge because number one, you don't need anybody but you to give you permission to go buy businesses. And number two, if you do feel that you're over your head, you can hire attor attorneys or accountants for pennies on the dollar of what it costs them to learn all the things that you needed to know. and. I use attorneys and accountants still, yeah. right? I'm And I'm both of those things. So uh, to me, that's just not the highest and best use of my time. And then as far as um, having to, to have the cash, you, you, just, you just don't always need it. Now, there are businesses that are in an auction environment that are more traditional that you will need that for. And there's some people that are stubborn. And even if they can't sell their business, they're going to still hold out for cash and never get it. And then, you know, maybe you'll buy it from their heirs. But... Um, but then the next thing comes to, well, how do I build up a bunch of deal flow? Do I need to have, you know, a million followers across my social media and podcasts and all these other things and know a bunch of investment bankers and all that? I mean, all of that helps, but you don't, you just need to put yourself out there. And so one of the first things that I ask people to do is to declare that they're an investor. And so change their social media to say investor. Whatever else you do in the world, if you can self-identify as an investor and you can proclaim that to the world, then everybody that you meet becomes a potential referral. And all of us are meeting people every single day. So if it's, what is the first thing that most people say after how you doing is like, oh, what do you do? I'm an investor. What do you invest in? Actually, I buy companies. Holy crap, you just became the most interesting person in the room, right? <laughs> so like it's it's just if you can break it down and get past the the mental part, all of the how do you do this stuff, like how do you find deals and can you do it with no money and all that just falls away and then you find yourself starting to actually get deal flow. Mm, so so the mental acuity that you need or or uh, maybe not acuity but the the mental the perspective as far as examining yourself and the situation. So internal and external audit on your emotions and your perspectives. Uh, yeah. It sounds like I'm totally putting words in your mouth, but it sounds like from your experience, that is a big differentiator of those who succeed in, in your industry and those who do not. Is that a fair statement? I think, yes, absolutely. I think it's actually the differentiator between most people who succeed yeah. Yeah, in any honest. business. Yeah, yeah. Let's you know. be honest. Yeah. Awesome. It's it's it, because most of the limitations we have are we find we hang our doubts about ourselves on rungs of reasons yeah. that are excuses for why we can't do something, and most of those are not real. They're just justifications for us not to take a risk because we're afraid. Yeah. Right. And so the people that you see over and over again from every industry that are the most successful got past their fear. Not that they didn't have it. Yeah. They just put it aside and said, screw it. I'm going to, I'm going to go forward. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. And, you know, I'm curious of what you've seen. Uh, I mean, like I, I said at the beginning, you've gone full God mode in private equity. So, I mean, you're all in on this sector. So from your perspective, uh, I think I know the answer, but I would love to hear yours. Um, what impact, uh, you hear this expression called the silver tsunami, right? So it's, it's baby boomers. Typically just anyone retiring, whether you're a baby boomer or not, this, there's this huge wave of people selling businesses, or at least that's the perception. Are you finding that the, the so-called silver tsunami is a real thing? Um, do you find that there's an uptick in people selling their businesses? Have, do you have any insight on, on that? Yes. Um, so I would say for me, because of the circles I travel in, I don't see it as much. Um, but I will tell you that 
um, companies that I have ownership in that are in, say, um, locksmiths or automobile repair or um, uh, appliance repair, plumbing, HVAC, electrical, all of these are, are companies that I have interests in in those industries. And they are very much filled with people that are, you know, that are either aging out or the silver tsunami crowd. Um, in my world, I would say the average age of the person that I do a deal with runs from maybe 28 to 42. Okay. Um, it skews younger and, uh, and I'm right on the cusp. So I'm either an ex boomer or a baby or a gen baby or something like that. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah. But but so I so I see it in traditional businesses, but because a lot of the things I do are more um, software or tech driven or newer yeah. media type things, yeah. um, I don't see as much of it as as you do in those other industries. But I think it's just as a fact, just because of the fact that that I'm interested in things that are attracting that that slightly younger crowd. Awesome. So interesting. And so now, you know, my understanding is you've built a pretty significant mastermind group. I believe you call it the War Room. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the benefits of joining maybe any mastermind, but more specific yours and kind of the stuff that people can expect if they really go all in with Roland Fraser, which I recommend you do. But those who 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 want to go in, they're they're part of Epic Network, they're joining the War Room. They're, I mean, they're all in with you, man, and you've got a lot to offer. What can people expect from being a member of the War Room? Cool name, by the way. Yeah, it's it's a really great question. So so let's talk about it from a mastermind concept. Um, I would recommend that anyone join multiple masterminds because I find that like my approach to life has been that that has been very effective in business is that if I can go to a center of influence that has a large number of people who also have a large number of people that I might want to connect with to do business, it's kind of meta, right? It's up one. It's like, I don't just want to be part of a group of people that has the people that I want. I prefer for there to be a group of people uh, that have been aggregated that all have a bunch of people that I want. Yeah. And so I find that masterminds are a really, really great way to do that. So I own um, two, three, four, five, six. I own about nine masterminds and I am a member of about another nine. And um, they're in different verticals. So yeah. we have them in real estate agents and real estate investors and businesses and marketing people and entrepreneurial investors. And, um, and the war room, uh, which actually is sunsetting at the, uh, at the end of next month, next month, yeah, okay. um, will be our last war room meeting because uh, there are, we found that there's like very specific war room was started by Ryan Dice and Perry Belcher. Um, maybe 12 or 14 years ago and they got together they actually started it because they had an event and they didn't have anything to sell and they had to pay for the event and they were like holy crap how are we going to pay for this thing and yeah. um, and it was kind of a marketing mind a mastermind and then I came in around um, I was a member for three years and then I became a partner in it around 2013 and um, and we evolved it to be more business oriented but there were still people that wanted marketing stuff and there were people that wanted investing stuff and there were people that wanted uh, business stuff and so um, we decided to, to to have more specifically focused masterminds. So now we have the Modern Marketing Mastermind for marketing. We've got uh, Founders Board for people who are entrepreneurial that want to get an operating system installed and kind of scale their business, meaning the infrastructure to be able to accept more business. And then we have um, uh, Epic Board, which is all about how do I exit and structure myself and get ready to cash out? And then what do I do with the money? And how do I keep as much of that as possible? And yeah. now how do I start investing as an entrepreneur. Um, so what, what I think is really helpful about owning a mastermind is that immense connectivity, authority, and deal flow will come to you as a result of doing that. And so we run mastermind sprints to show people how to create masterminds uh, for whatever they're in. So yeah. let's say they're in the HVAC space and they want to get that. Well, let's help you put together 
a mastermind for HVAC people because now you'll be the person that they all come to and you'll be able to talk to them and do yeah. deals with them, yeah. right? And so um, so then it goes to, in, in terms of being a member of, of those, being a member of a mastermind, like almost every really big connection I've got, I can go five levels of, you know, what is it? Five degrees of separation back to a mastermind yeah. because that's a place where all of the people who are involved have, who might be very close to receiving you yeah. in their business, in their field, in their environment that they're normally in because they're busy and they don't have time to talk to people. But in a mastermind, they have stepped up and raised their hand and usually made an investment to yeah. say, I want to do deals with people. I want relationships with other people that are like me or that are different from me that I can learn from. I want to be vulnerable. I want to share the things that aren't going right. I want to share the things that are going right. So you get them in the right state of mind. And whether you're the owner authority person in the mastermind or you're a member, that is definitely the most receptive that you'll, I think, find people to being outside of hiring them if they're available through a paid channel of access like consulting or speaking or something like that. So yeah. I love masterminds for that and I love hiring speakers for that and I love hiring people as a consultant for that because now they're there to serve me That's instead right. of me saying, hey, can I pick your brain? You know, I, I ran into you on the street or you're in the middle of doing something that you're doing and I'm like, hey, can I interrupt you? And for no give, ask you to do things for me that sounds like a horrible deal right <laughs> that's right so you know as as we round third base and we really take this home i think the one thing that's remaining is we talked about finding businesses key criteria joining masterminds all the cool stuff we have except for one thing and you danced around it a little bit so let's talk about it what are some of the things that make for a good exit yeah so so I, i've got 50 um what I call value amplifiers that, that will make the difference. I, I would say that like, ultimately you have to think about what's going to make for an exit is going to be whatever will be the most appealing to a potential acquirer. And so what do acquirers want? Well, they generally have some sort of acquisition criteria. So if you can find out what does that look like and then make your business fit that acquisition criteria. And they're usually key players in any, any industry. So there are private equity funds that specialize in a particular type of business. And they may be doing a roll up in HVAC, we mentioned, or they may be um, acquiring info businesses or Amazon, uh, aggregating Amazon uh, FBA companies, yep. right? And, um, and so if you know what their acquisition criteria is, which is typically available, either on their website or by asking whoever is in charge of business development or M&A, okay. then you can kind of find out and build a composite of what does a fictitious company that would be the most appealing to all the people that I talked about look like. And so I like kind of knowing what is the end result that I need and then reverse engineering my way to it. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that specific thing there, I'd say that really it's about how can I really fully optimize my profitability? So what are the things that I'm doing right now that maybe makes sense from saving taxes or reinvesting in the company or things like that. But as I'm looking to exit, maybe I change the way I do those things to help increase my profitability because most businesses will sell for some multiple of their profit. How can I reduce the risk to a potential buyer that what they're buying isn't what they're getting when they buy isn't what they were hoping to get. Yeah. And so then that comes to, well, what are the things that could go wrong? well, my numbers could be wrong. So I'm going to get audited financials because now I've got a third-party accountant that's standing behind the numbers saying, sue me if I'm wrong. And I've got uh, all of my legal documentation in place so that their attorney can look at it and say, yep, they wrote the software and they hired people and the people signed off on it and released it. Yep, it's all good. All their contracts are done. They're in place. Uh, the, your employees have you had a conversation with your key employees about what does it look like to stay? Is it possible to have them under longer term employment contracts? Or at least do you have 
a bench depth that is deep enough so that if you lose a key employee or two, there are plenty of people there that can take their place. Are you an owner operator so that you're going to potentially want to exit, but you're still wearing the key person hat in two or three job titles, right? How can you get yourself off the org chart so that you are not something that needs to come with the company? If you are on the org chart and you go, who takes that place? And, um, and so I think if you can get like just a few of those key things in place, then you're going to be able to really optimize your exit value. Man, I, I absolutely love that. Look, I mean, well said, uh, of course it is for Roland Fraser. This is really, really cool stuff. So, you know, as we wrap things up, um, you know, just remember to, um, follow those metrics that you're looking for. Roland gave you a, f- a little bit of advice. I would say find a mentor or whether that's Roland or somebody else to, to bring them in. If this is your first deal, it cannot hurt. I mean, it can only help you give you that, that, as we say, the first taste of blood where you're like, wow, I actually made a lot of money on this thing. I want to do another. Having a mentor like Roland or, or anyone in that sector, I would certainly recommend uh, Roland, but Having someone who's done this before, a lot before, can certainly help you to just prime that pump and get you started on a career in this area. Joining masterminds, understanding your metrics, and ultimately preparing your business for an exit under the criteria of what the buyer would want. You do these things, and you too will be well on your way in your pursuit of making billions. Wow, what a show. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Now, if you haven't done so already, be sure to leave a comment and review on new ideas and guests you want me to bring on for future episodes. Plus, why don't you head over to YouTube and see extra takes while you get to know our guests even better. And make sure to come back for our next episode where we dive even deeper into the people, the process, and the perspectives of both investors and founders. Until then, my friends, stay hungry, focus on your goals, and keep grinding towards your dream of making billions.